Welcome back to Dave's Gone By on AM 1240 WGBB in Freeport, New York, and live streaming on the web on AM 1240 WGBB.com. And I, I've always been proud now that I've had my radio show on the station for about three years. And I was really excited when I did my 100th show, and, uh, you know, I'm coming past my 150th show now, and I feel really proud that I've done it for this long. Now, I've got a guest who puts that so far to shame, (laughs) it's almost ridiculous. This man has been not only on the radio for 60 years, he's been doing the same program for 60 years on, I I believe, the very same station. And not only that, it's a really good program. I never change that program. I put it on, I take it off. I put it on, I take it off. Kind of like my underpants. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, I have with me on the phone... Oscar Brand, and I do not use this word lightly, a legend in folk music, and technically also in radio. Happy 60th um, radio anniversary. It's December 10th, by the way, was the day you went on the air in 1945 on WNYC. It's true. It's all very, very true and unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. So don't try to convince me. (laughs) Well, how did it start? How did you go from where you were at that point to to having this radio radio show? Well, I was a psychologist. I'd been in the Army for three years, helped them win the war, because when I started we were losing it, when we finished and I left the Army, we were winning. I don't have to call your attention to the uh, coincidence. That's what happened. Well, well done. Now Thank I you. was out into the free air with uh, a couple of million other soldiers, and uh, I didn't have a job. That's a terrible thing not to have a job, especially if you're not working in the same area that you worked in the past. I was offered some good jobs as a psychologist, but anything else. And also, I would figure coming out of the war, there would have been, well, the role in industry would have been big back then. Or was... Well, there were a lot of guys who didn't go into the Army who managed to get out. I didn't want to get out. I got in because I wanted to get in. Hmm. And uh, when I got out, I realized how foolish I had been because there were no jobs for me. So Hmm. I decided I would... I, what is it I love to do? Well, I love to sing. Okay, I was able to sing. But you don't get jobs singing on radio. You just don't. And then I remembered that I love to write even more. So I thought, I will get a job, find a job where I can write and sing. Hmm. Now, you can write and sing without it being your work. I mean, as long as you're writing and you're getting paid for it. But I wasn't much of a singer. And... Um, well, you're a, um, you're Anybody a will voice. tell you that I wasn't much of a singer recently, either. <laughs> okay. And uh, I got in touch. I sent letters to all the radio stations in New York City. And there were a bunch of them, and they were the big deal because there was no television. Right. And uh, the nice people who called on me, I won't forget. Um, but the one I really remember is man named Herman Newman at WNYC, the New York City station owned by the city of New York. And they, uh, Herman called on me and said, uh, come in, I'll talk to you. It was Sunday, back to Sunday in December. And I went in to talk to him. And I had a four-string guitar with me because I learned on a four-string banjo just a little while before. Mm-hmm. And he said, what would you like to do? And I said, I would like to do a program, and I have a script right here. He looked at the script and said, well, now, um, uh, you could do this yourself? I said, yes, all by myself. He said, well, try it. Put it on a music stand, set up a uh, radio, uh, the microphone, Mm -hmm. and it was, let's see, about it was 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock. I started, and I sang and talked and recited for a little while. And when the program, when the time was over, he, I said, how was that? And he said, very, very good. We've even gotten some calls. I said, you mean you were broadcasting? <laughs> oh, wow. He said, yes. Now, the funny thing was, I'd taken off my shoes because I was pounding my feet, which I always do when I sing mm-hmm. with a rhythm to it. And the announcer, the um, engineer whom you could see, indicated and it was a very intricate thing because he had to bring his shoes up to the window to show me what it was he wanted done and he took off his shoes and I took off mine but that's as far as we went in fact I never saw him again do you remember the songs that you sang in that very first I'll bet you do 
I remember a couple of them because they were a special kind. What I wrote in the letter to all these people was I would sing Christmas songs that their audience hadn't heard before. And that was easy because there were only three or four Christmas songs being sung at that time and being sung and sung and sung and oversung and finally right. becoming a nuisance, even though they were fine and beautiful songs written by great composers and stuff. So I sang, I remember the song I learned in Canada, the Burgundian Carol. A very pretty song. However, it was a political song, and I didn't know whether I could get away with it, because I sang it in English. I translated it. It was, um, The icy season of the year When to the world our Lord was born The and donkey, so they say, did keep his holy presence warm. And I, I sang that, and um, the last verse, by the way, was different from the way it was recorded later by the weavers. It was a straightforward political verse that said, How many oxen and donkeys then, if they were there, were first he came. How many oxen and donkeys today? And actually, the words would have been put in as how many, how many oxen and donkeys now dressed in ermine silks and such? Oh, how so many it's... oxen and donkeys now, if they were there, would do as much? It was actually an attack on the church and the nobility, and it was written in the 15th or 14th century by a monk named Brebeuf. Hmm. Oh, wait a minute, was that Oops. Brebeuf or did he write the... I sang a Indian song on the program, song from Canada again, because I was from Canada. And the Indian song was by Father Brebeuf. Uh, the other was by... Um, oh, what was his name? Hmm. I forget right now, Montoy. Uh, also a, um, a friar. Friars wrote the best song. And the Indian song was by Father Brebeuf, who wrote the words to an old French song and taught it to the Indians in the Indian language, especially, I believe it was Mohawk. Wow. So, so I sang yeah. that song. And I also sang um, uh, one of Lead Belly's songs I had learned when I was working with him, which I did for quite a while. It's a song that went, the Chickens crowed for midnight and it's almost rain. Chicken crowed for midnight and it's almost day. Think I hear my mother say it's almost day. I think I hear my mother say it's almost day. Santa Claus is coming and it's almost day. Santa Claus is coming and it's almost day. Lead Billy used to sing it with this tremendous accompaniment that sounded like a great barrel organ. And now, he made it into a great song. Were, how did you meet? Someone like Lead Belly. Well, that was easy. I was a singer, and he was a singer, and we sang together. And then, when uh, in those days, he couldn't get into the restaurants, nor could he get into the groceries, nor the hotels, or any place, because he was black. So they sent me out on tour with him when he was doing a program. You go with him and make sure he gets something to eat and something to drink, and that the police don't arrest him for driving his own car. Wow. And back then, again, since he started this... We think of the folk music movement as being a bit later than that, like starting with the Weavers, sort of the early 50s. But who did you have on in those first couple of years in the 40s? What was folk music then? Well, I had Gene Raskin was one of the first of the people who was on. And Gene Raskin was professor of architecture at Columbia, who wrote and rewrote a lot of old songs, including one called Those Were the Days, which later became a very important hit. Sure. Um... There was Peter Seeger, who was around all the time, a young man who'd been out with the Almanac Singers and had been in the Army uh, as a kind of as a, I don't know what you call it, entertainment, although he was way out in the, um, in the Asian area. And Pete Seeger came on and he sang. And um, there was Bill Cole. Bill got me into trouble. Uh, Bill Cole was an Irish singer. Actually, he was an Irish um, book uh, publisher and so on. He got me my first book as a favor. Mm -hmm. and I had done him a favor of putting him on the air with a bunch of songs from that he said were from a, a book that he'd gotten, and he had the book with him. It said, uh, Soldaten Lieder, meaning the soldier.
soldier songs that he got from a dead German soldier mm-hmm. uh, right after the Battle of Bulge. And um, he sang some very, very fine German songs of the period. Well, I can understand that being a little bit controversial. Well, uh, they were German songs. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what happened. I got a, a, right as soon as I finished. This was the, about the third week, by the way, when they... Uh, but Newman has said, what are you doing next week? And I came, I said, I'm coming, going to be right here. And I came right there. And that's the agreement I've had with WNYC <laughs> all these 60 years. I do that as program every week. And all I have is the invitation from Herman Newman back in 1945. What are you doing next week? Oh, that's wonderful. Well, anyway, uh, Cole sang the song. And then Newman came into the studio and said, Oscar, the mayor of New York wants to talk to you. Now, the mayor of New York I had met before under other circumstances. Are we talking LaGuardia, or is this pre Yeah, okay. The Little Flower. And I went across the street, which is where City Hall is, from the municipal building where we broadcast, and uh, went upstairs. They allowed me upstairs. They didn't have much uh, security at the time besides someone who told them to let me in. And the one who told them was on the second floor in a private office, and I went into the private office, but there was nobody had seen that. Mm-hmm. Then from behind the desk, a voice said, Mr. Brown? And uh, I looked, and sure enough, there he was. This small man, this tiny, round man, who was the greatest mayor this country had ever seen, and probably one of the greatest politicians we've ever seen, as well as the finest person we've ever seen, or heard, or talked to, and I talked to him. I said, you called me, sir. He said, yes, what's this I hear about your playing Nazi songs on my radio station? People are calling me up and telling me they don't have to stand for it. They don't want to stand for it. He said, luckily, he said, I'm getting out of office this year. This is my last year. I don't have to worry about being elected, but the station's got to stay on the air. I said, Mr. LaGuardia, these are old songs, some of them from the Hundred Years' War, hundreds of years ago. These are not Nazi songs. They're pure unadulterated, simple soldier songs long before there was a Nazi or fascist group. He said, oh, oh, no, that's all right. But wait, wait, but what am I going to tell these people who are going to crawl up and say, we don't want to spend our money on this fellow or this, or this show? I said, well, you can, can tell them I don't get paid. He said, oh, that'll do it. <laughs> and uh, ever since then, I've been doing the program with his... Imprimatur, that'll do it. And Herman Newman's, what are you doing next week? And the fact that I don't get paid. You, you really, in all those 60 years, you've been doing it gratis? Uh, gratis, I wish it were gratis, but it costs a lot of money. Over the years, taxis getting down or sure. paying guests of mine who couldn't make it by car or something. Or on the special occasions, buying all kinds of um, drinks. Not not hard drink. Well, of I course. Won't go for that. Or drink, not that you can say on the air. Yeah. Games and sand, sandwiches. I paid for it all. And when we did the special program every year at Cooper Union, I paid for the hall. And I paid for the ushers. Good heavens! I, I mean, nice of you. That's... No, I'm, not, I'm a rat. No, no, no question. <laughs> well, let me ask. I mean, do you get then to have sponsors on the station? Is, is or no? This is a the public radio. Total this public is the radio. flagship. Of the national public radio. Wow. Well, I, I think they're lucky. Yeah. You're lucky to have them, and they're very lucky to have you, I think. So, moving... Lucky to have each other. It's a beautiful thing. Beautiful. Yeah. Hi, I'm Oscar Brand. I'm usually on every Saturday night at 10 o'clock on WNYC. But you have a chance, if you keep up to this station, of listening to Dave every week, every day, every hour, in fact, because you can't <laughs> shut him up. Thank you, Oscar, I think. <laughs> That's very kind of you. To be continued. Um, so moving on from your third show, what were some of the other um, guests and people that you had moving from the late 40s into the early 50s? Well, I would have Earl Lives on. He was around. and uh, Richard Dyer Bennett was a regular, and so was um, uh, Woody Guthrie. He was always on the program. He always would come up in the middle of the program without telling me he was coming and tell me he had some new songs, which he would then sing on the air. It was a very loose situation, and as a consequence, it was much more fun. Well, well absolutely. Did he premiere any songs on, on your show that have gone on to become 
Well, he got free. Yes. Like what? Like what? Practically all his songs <laughs> went on. Uh, um, I remember the first time he, no, it wasn't the first time. It was about the 15th time he appeared. The door opened in the middle of a program where I had an audience of about 40 kids in there, all sitting there joining the singing, and it was very exciting. My, my, uh, um, my guest was, I think, Cisco Houston. Wow. And, uh, which is one of the reasons uh, Woody came in. And Gene Ritchie was a regular on a program singing the traditional songs of Kentucky. And I had a group called the, um, oh, the Shanty Boys. Roger sprung on the banjo, six, uh, the five string banjo, about the first time it was heard in the city of New York. And suddenly the door opened, and while I was doing an introduction to a song I was about to sing, in came Woody. And Woody <laughs> had a new song. And uh, the song was uh, about droughts and floods in, in America. Gee, I ought to put that on. And it turned out to... This is the yeah. time for it, yeah. It was uh, high floods and low waters all around, all around. High floods and low waters all around. New York City's a terrible placer. Serving warm whiskey without any chaser. High floods and low water and so on. Wow. Uh, there's a number of his amazing. songs, like uh, So Long It's Been Good to Know You, which he borrowed from a song called Billy the Kid, or This Land is Your Land, which he borrowed from a Carter family song, and so on. He borrowed it from, from everybody for everything. So he, you know, everybody points at Bob Dylan for being the big borrower, but Woody was borrowing just as much, only was much more obscure songs for, for people at that point. Well, for people who didn't know the other songs. Well, yeah, you knew. You. How did you develop such an incredible... Well, Bob Dylan, by the way, was yeah. one of my first guests. Oh, I, I was going to get to that. I, I, he came to the city. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I Believe me, I'm going to ask about that. But before then, I think it's only fair to ask how you came across or came about such an encyclopedic knowledge of folk music then. Um, so well, that first you were of all, I come equipped. from Canada. Okay. And in Canada, Canada when I, uh, where I was born, uh, they didn't have the television. They didn't have much radio. My brother made a crystal set, and that was it. You don't get far out of a crystal <laughs> set in Winnipeg, Manitoba, in the middle of the prairie. And um, there was no other way of, uh, of entertaining oneself than going to a theater, which was very expensive, or getting out on the street and singing your song and playing the games and uh, doing the body songs, which everybody loved, and we sang them in low voices. That's where the songs came from. Later on, of course, we have our own entertainment and theaters for very little money in some of them. By the way, I, I should also mention uh, Oscar Brand is talking about quote-unquote bawdy songs, but that was sort of a whole sideline as part of your career. No, it was not a sideline. I made it a sideline because nobody was recording any of these marvelous songs. So I decided, well, it was a long story, but I decided I would take a chance and fight my way through the Puritans of America. And I sang a whole bunch of them, which sold almost 7 million copies. But again, I didn't get paid for them. Well, how could you have not? Whose label was it? It was called Audio Fidelity. Yes, yes, yes. The deal I made with Sid Fry was, if I sing the songs, will you promise to put them out? And that was... We kept our words. I, sang, I wrote, I sang the songs. He put them out. They went all over the world. And then let people know that they were not the only ones singing the song because everybody knew them and everybody was singing them. And I could hardly, I could hardly avoid learning more because every time I sang a song when I was hitchhiking to Canada or back, and I did a lot of that, mm -hmm. every bar... And every hotel uh, restaurant where I was hoping for a chance to eat something, when I would sing any song, somebody or many people would come up, and each one of them would have this refrain: "That's a good song, but I know a better one." <laughs> and, and by the way, if people might be familiar with these, either obviously from from the record collections or like. Occasionally, Dr. Demento will dip into his bag for the clean yeah. song, or, oh dear, what can the matter be, seven old ladies locked in the lavatory. Well, he Love takes it. the easy ones, the tough well. ones I recorded, he don't take. Well, <laughs> I remember going out to see him when we talked for I said, how come you don't do the Winnipeg whore? <laughs> 
And he said, well, I don't know how long I'd last if I did that. I'm, get, I'm getting away with murder as it is. Yeah. And, and, hey, I've done my share of Winnipeg whores, and, and they're kind of cold. But, you know, sorry. Anywho, um, I want to get to a break in this part of the conversation, but you did mention Bob Dylan. Yeah. So let's go there. He All was right. there 62, 63? Well, I don't know the exact date that Bob came up. He came from... Fargo. Actually, he came from South Dakota, North Dakota. H- Hibbing. Hib- well, Hibbing and then uh, Duluth, North Dakota, yeah. Well, North Dakota was closer to it. And that was very, very close to me because I come from just north of North Dakota, mm-hmm. from Manitoba. And there was this kid who would come in. I had a radio show. I had people coming to listen to me at concerts. And there was this kid come in and uh, he was singing old songs, which he didn't sing so well because they were new to him in a way. Um, he had, he was a pop music player. He could play the piano and read music and do all the things that we didn't do. But he knew that he wasn't going to get any place against all the big pop singers, so he went to the folk music world, and he, he handled it as if he liked it, and that was enough for me. He handled it as if it was his world, and that was enough for me. And so... I fed him a couple of times, Dave Van Runk, got him a place to sleep, and um, this poor pinch-faced young man started doing fairly well. In fact, um, what got him really to the top, what started him, was a session that he did with um, Carolyn Hester, a lovely girl, great singer from Waco, Texas, and she was getting, she was doing very well, and she was getting a recording. And she asked him to play the harmonica. And at the recording was John Hammond. Right. A tremendous person, a Vanderbilt, who yet was terrific in the world of folk music and the blues and so on. He heard this young Bob Dylan accompany her on the harmonica. And he called him over and talked with him, said, come up to my office, and signed him up. Because he had already signed up, oh, he had signed up some of the greatest. Oh, John sure, Hammond. Billy Holiday and... and yeah, uh, he was... Um, um, he never signed his son up, though. John <laughs> Hammond Jr., who was a terrific blues player. But at first, he did not like the idea of his son, a nice white boy from upper-class America, singing black songs. But he yeah. got over it. Good for him. Good. Did oh, he, yeah. I mean, not, not to, to... But did he ever, like, try to sign you? Or did you do any Columbia albums? Uh, the Colum- only Columbia album I did was, um, I, th- I think it was in, in, um, in White America, and I didn't really do that album. I was a music director. I got Willie, uh, Billy Fair to do it because there was a lot of guitar work. It was the first historical black uh, show. Um, hmm. See, the two people around it, Gloria Foster, a tremendous actress, and Moses Gunn, who went right to the motion pictures, uh, they were in the show, a lot of other people, but uh, the important point was that they sang the songs. I put songs in to illustrate events in black history. It was called White America? What was the name White of the album? Ameri- in White America. In White America, right. I know, running around someplace being performed. I mean, I know you also did Broadway, a uh, couple of Broadway shows. You've done so much, and, and I, I unfortunately have to break uh, at this point. But you I mean really I can't tell you the rest of my life? Soon. All right, sure. uh, I, I think I'll, I'll tell you how, how I was on the panel that created Sesame Street. Exactly. And how I was blacklisted from both sides, from the, the red and the white sides of American life. Oh, I'll tell you lots of stories, and some of them are true. We're back with Oscar Brand on Dave's Gone By, a legend in folk music, and in other ways, probably less well-known, he's had some legendary experiences as well, including you were part of the team that helped develop Sesame Street? Because I work with WNYC, which doesn't pay me. It pays everybody else, but it doesn't pay me. There's a good reason for that. <laughs> um, maybe if you ask me, I'll tell you. But meanwhile, I had to find other employment. And so I worked on WNEW. I worked on uh, seven years with NBC, uh, the Children's Programming Department, Hmm. Um, with CBS, uh, with a daily program, an evening program every night, one hour long, and so on. I worked with other stations, 
I make documentaries. I record over a hundred uh, recordings and so on. Mm-hmm. I'm always working. It's my job to work. Um, well, wouldn't it be great if we all had jobs where we goofed off? Actually, I've had jobs like no, that. No, I don't like that. Uh, I don't like that. When I get a job, I've got to work at it. If I'm not working at it, it troubles me. Hmm. Because I must do everything I can before I die. And um, you never know how much you can until you die. And by then, I'll be dead. That's true. So the important thing is to keep working, keep doing as well as much and as, as well as you can, and enjoy every second of it. And that's what I do. Where did Sesame Street come about? Ah, well, one day while I was working at NBC, a reviewer, our archivist, uh, one of the great uh, children's psychologists in the business, Jerry Lesser, mm-hmm. Gerald Lesser, Professor Gerald Lesser. Professor Lesser, okay. PhD, DHS, RUF, all kinds of stuff. Mm-hmm. And Jerry came to me and he said, listen, Oscar, we're trying to work something out, uh, a workshop for television. And like to, if you could join us. I said, well, when is it and where is it? He said, well, the first couple of weeks are going to be in Harvard. Oof. And uh, I said, ah. He said, everything's taken care of. You'll get uh, not only your uh, car fare and, and uh, lodgings and food, but also $100 a day. Now, $100 a day doesn't seem like much because you usually get a lot more than that on a one-night performance. Mm-hmm. But if you get it every day, yeah. wow, at a time when $100 is a lot of money. This would have been 67, I assume, or 68, right? About 68, yeah. yeah. And so I said, fine, I'd love to do it. I'd be very, very grateful. And uh, I received a letter later signed by Miss Cooney saying that I was on a panel which was working on creating a children's television workshop and also a long document telling me why it was being done and so on. I knew why it was being done. I'd done children's shows for years, and I knew the audiences were the audiences that could buy, and they were not the audience we were empowered to reach. Hmm. When I saw the whole list of what was happening, it was very simple. They had discovered that a lot of children coming up from the Appalachians, a lot of black children coming up from the South, even living in the North, and uh, all over the country, were not coming into school with the ease, with the breadth of, uh, of material uh, that some people in the middle classes were. And that's, of course, the upper classes. Mm-hmm. And I knew that situation because I had had it. Came down from Canada with my family. I was a kid. Went into the streets. My father and mother had to move, uh, had to work like crazy because it was the Depression days. They didn't have time for me or my brother or sister. So we made our own way in the streets. And uh, where it came to reading anything, hell, I never read anything. There wasn't anything in the house except the newspaper, which my father read, bless him. So that I was very, very sensitive to the needs of kids who come into school one day for the first time, find themselves surrounded by knowledgeable young people who have culture in their homes, who listen to the radio, watch television, do all these marvelous things. There was no television part right who listen to the radio, who read books or have books read to them. I didn't have any of that. And I knew what it was like to get into the classroom and realize that you don't know anything, that you are an idiot, or rather an ignoramus, which is Mm -hmm. more exact. And I said, I've got to do something, and I'm one of the few people who knows, the people who are going to be on that panel. They don't know anything about getting into a situation where everybody else knows something, and they're ignoramuses. Ignoramai. Yeah. Well, I, I was very, very happy about that. And that's why Ford, the Ford Foundation, gave money to support the efforts of the committee and the panel. Mm-hmm. That's why the Catholic Charities gave a great deal of money because they had problems in their schools with kids coming in with the same problem. Um, the Office of Economic Opportunity gave money. Money came from all directions. I have a list of the people who donated money or the organizations, and it was a very, very impressive list. And all they really wanted was get these kids who didn't have a chance otherwise and give them a little education some way through television so that when they went into a classroom for the first time, they didn't feel like outsiders, like aliens in a strange world. I thought that was a great idea. I was willing to spend all my time at it. And I did. Yeah. I did. I took time. I took part of my family. In fact, my whole family 
to Harvard for those weeks, and we argued and studied, but there was something happening that uh, made me uncomfortable, um, and that was that the trend of the program, the skew of the program, seemed to be towards the middle class, seemed to be towards people maybe not rich and maybe not even well-to-do, but certainly not not disassociated from the culture of the society. Right. It was very uncomfortable. I kept on trying to skew it back to, to, to like leaning on the oar on the side that you don't want to, that you want the audio, the boat to go while the other side is pumping. I let them pump, but right. I try to keep moving it towards the use of children who had no education whatsoever, who needed that cultural moment so that they could avoid the shock of coming into a classroom and, and believing they had nothing. Because what you get on that first day and those first weeks is what makes you, what gives you your attitude towards schooling and education. If you feel that they don't need you, they don't want you, and you don't belong, well, that's what you're going to take with you into the upper classes, upper grades. Hmm. I know. Believe me, I know. So that was at Harvard. Right. And I tried my best to move it away from the suburban, middle-class approach, because that was not what we were supposed to do. But let me stop by saying that's what Sesame Street was and became and is. It is not for kids who have no background, no cultural background, no education in the home, whose parents, whether it's one or two, whose parents don't have the time to spend with them. It's not for those kids at all. It's for all the other kids who are able to buy clothes and are able to buy toys and are able to buy anything that Sesame Street doesn't buy, doesn't sell, but still seems to move in that direction. And I was with, at that time, with Morris, um, Maurice, with children's artist, uh, Sendak. Oh, Sendak. With Sendak. I was with Maurice Sendak, and he kept whispering to me, they don't know what they're talking about. So I gathered that he had the same childhood experience I had. Hmm. I don't even believe he was born in this country, which is also deadly. I wasn't born in this country. I'm a Canadian. Ugh. And well, my background was quite different from any of the kids that were in the schools. Anyway, that's what I was on, and that's what I was doing. So do you feel, you seem like you feel a little bitter about... Bitter? No, I feel a little frustrated. And I will tell you something else. I must have sounded bitter, as I said, but no, we don't want to have a Captain Kangaroo, whom they brought up to lecture to us. We don't need, we don't want to have a... Um, Oh, well, Mr. 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 Rogers. Rogers. I said, these kids will laugh at these people because they speak a language that they don't understand. I said, it's a different world in the gutter. It's a different world in poverty. And I kept pushing in that direction. I finally got some of the things I wanted. I wanted a city, I, a, mid, a mid-city street with uh, garbage cans all over the place, and I got that. They call it Sesame Street, but it's not the suburbs. Right. I wanted a house, a nice little place. Oh, 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 oh. And I didn't want that. I wanted the steps. I didn't even want to go into an, a house or an apartment because they were pretty rotten. I know. I lived in them. Right. Um, when I'm talking about that, I'm not saying that my parents weren't intelligent or, or educated or anything. It's just that they hadn't the time for us anymore. They were busy just trying to, 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 to work out a, a living be able to buy food and maybe clothes once in a while. Not often, but once in a while. Anyway, that's what I was doing on Sesame Street. And it never occurred to me when I saw the garbage cans, which I had fought for, mm-hmm. which were supposed to be brimming with garbage, but weren't. And the kids who were all clean were not supposed to be. I can't begin to imagine... What Sesame Street would have been like had you gotten your way? That's a big question. It would have been like good times, sort of, I guess. It, it would have been different from what it was, and it would have made for a... Well, the, I think... You can't the, say it would have made for a... No offense, but I, I don't think you could have improved upon those early years of Sesame Street. Maybe you could have. Well, I could have put it, made it what it was supposed to be. Let's yeah. not forget, it was not... It, the money was not given to it. It didn't have a purview for cultural 
or for uh, bright kids and so on. It didn't have any of that. I was happy they got Jim Henson because he was great. Yeah. I, I saw him on Saturday night. I, I saw his work, and I thought he was marvelous. And, in fact, not long after I, Sesame Street was already started, and he had gone to Hollywood to work with his studio, I went out uh, to Lake Tahoe to see um, Glenn Yarbrough and Donaga, Donovan mm-hmm. uh, to interview them for my radio show. Also, I was I was also acting as a judge um, in a uh, whistling contest because I'm a special whistler. Are you really? Yeah, yeah. I have a, I have a gold medal in whistling and stuff like that. But no, not to interrupt, but did you know that one of my very first guests on this program is uh, Steve the Whistler Herbst, who is um, who is a championship whistler internationally. How did you get the championship? Well, I mean, they, they actually have one. They have them like every other year. I know. I, I was one of the judges. Oh, so you know him? I mean, have you ever seen I him? Don't remember. I, I don't remember any of the people I judged, but okay. I know there were some very, very good people. He was probably one of them. Wow. Anyway, I went yeah. over and I was talking to Glenn Yarbrough, and I was talking to him about a Christmas program uh, using uh, marionettes, among other things, or uh, hand puppets. Mm-hmm. And we were talking over it and about the music and so on. He said, listen, I talked the other day with Jim Henson on just this subject, and Maybe you want to give him a call. I said, all right, you call him. So he called Jim Henson. He said, Jim, this is Oscar Brand. And Jim Henson said, the grouch? (laughs) And he he did mean you. So there you go. (laughs) I don't know for sure, but he knew who I was. There had been talk. Uh, Probably in his instructions and so on. They may have even spoke about it. Joan Gans Cooney is no fool. She's a very capable, very wise woman. Mm-hmm. although she would never talk to me if she met me on the street anymore because I stood in her way with getting the whole thing moving and the very good possibility is that she was right and I was wrong. I'm very... Well, when someone says to me, do this, and I do it and anybody gets in the way, I can be very, very difficult. I can mm. be very pushy. I can, um, I can be very striking by striking anybody in my way or the way of the project I'm on. Right, okay. And I made a, a grouch of myself. I'm not really. I'm really very nice. You'd be surprised how nice I am. Oh, astonished, yes. Because, yeah, right. <laughs> Everybody knows that. So, but are you saying that there was some, perhaps, or that Oscar the Grouch may have been somewhat inspired by, well, certainly your garbage cans, but... Um, well, they had my garbage cans, and I had Jim Henson. And you were named Oscar. Oh my I named Oscar. God, and he was my favorite character on Sesame Street. Well, he's a marvelous character, and uh, he's like me in a way. Um, <laughs> okay. I'm not mean. I've got a good heart. Underneath all this is a very good, very good heart. Well, unfortunately, I think over the years, so does Oscar. They kind of, you know, they watered him down just a little bit. Yeah, he's well, a lot meaner. On the other hand, the kids, oh, there was a reason for Heath for the show. There, there was a reason they had... Start program. The head, yeah. Well, the Head Start program was one of the great inventions of all times. It was set up specifically to do what Sesame Street didn't, to arm these kids with a, a pre-education that would help them stand up with the other kids in the class who had plenty of culture at home. That's what Head Start is for. Okay. The Nixon administration, looking for money at the time, they things went bad immediately cut Head Start. And they looked for a way of supplanting it to doing the job that Head Start was supposed to do in some other way. And Joan Gans Cooney came up with the idea that television was probably, well, it wasn't her idea, I don't think, but she was the one who carried that banner, that Head Start could be supplanted by television, which all the kids, even the poorest kids, watched. Hmm. And that by having a television workshop, they could create programs that would do what was necessary, give them advance, uh, advance initiatives on counting, on, on numbers, even if you had to do it on your fingers, on maps and seas and, and words and so on, so that when the kids got into school, the kids they were after, the, the uncultured kids, the kids who needed the head, uh, head start, mm-hmm. when they got into school, they wouldn't feel completely lost. And I remembered how I felt. Lost. Completely lost. Mm. So that's what happened. Um, 
she managed, but the kids that she saved were not the kids that we were after originally. Those kids watch violence. Those kids sometimes watch puppets if the puppets are like the uh, South South Park and so on. Right. They don't watch Sesame Street. That's kid stuff. My children watched it. They were happy that I was associated with it, even though they never saw me on it, and never will. Mm. I made my I made my bed. I knew what I was doing. I knew I would never have a chance. Mm. And, but I did what I thought was best. Look, the fact that they started with a, um, uh, a an ethnic MC, I was fighting for that. I have all my notes. I'm using it in my... Um, my forthcoming autobiography. You know, you mentioned that on your website. Um, it's oscarbrand.com, right? And yeah. um, where people can go and, and find out about you and hear some of your tunes and, and things like that. Is it really a forthcoming autobiography or is it one oh, of those things that's been forthcoming for 30 problem, years? One of the big problems is that there's too much, much too much, of that I think is exciting and interesting. I've had a, In fact, the book is being... I'm going to call the book unless the editor hits me on the head. One hell of a ride. I had everything from a mob hit on, set on me, a contract set on me. By whom? By the mob. No, yeah, well, you know what I mean. In other words, I, was it I the was, Kennedys who were after you? This was part of my Broadway education. I discovered that Broadway money, a lot of it comes from the mob. And the reason is that one of the problems with making money illegally is that you have no way of showing where it came from. That's how they got Al Capone, and after that, everybody else. On taxes, on, on yeah. Right, on, right. Where does the money come from? How much money did you make? Etc. If they go to Broadway, it's easy. They get somebody to stand in front and take the brunt. They get very honest people, by the way, who just invest their money, not the honest people's money, but the mob's money, in shows. If the show is a, if the show fails, what the hell does it mean? A million dollars here, a couple of million. Right. Who cares? Well, but we're back then. It would have been like a quarter million. I mean, we're talking. Yeah, the show. The two shows I did on Broadway cost a hell of a lot more than a quarter of a million. Oh well, I mean, I'm saying, but I'm an individual investor will have put in. Yeah, now well, nowadays they yeah. don't have to. They spend a lot of money. In those days, I remember on one occasion. When a hundred and fifty thousand dollars was enough to buy you special, when you get special points. Right. Um, uh, by the way, let's remind everybody that you are, the shows you were on were Hyman Kaplan and A Joyful Noise. Those were the yeah, A points. Joyful Noise had problems raising money, and they finally did. However, there's one thing you don't do to the to the syndicate. You don't make fools of them. And yeah. I've always been careful to be an honest gentleman. I mean, the honesty is what always, if, uh, but a gentleman, they know, they have known, that whatever I did, it was not to their detriment. Okay. However, there was somebody else involved, involved who was. They felt. It wasn't true, but they felt that way. And feeling that he and the rest of us, Dory Shari. Oh, my gosh. Michael Bennett. And I and my partner Paul Nassa, that we were cheating them, which was not so. It was never so. I wouldn't do it because I was too smart. Dory wouldn't do it because he was an honest man and was a millionaire. What the hell? Hmm. And Michael Bennett, all he wanted to do was choreograph. Right. All he wanted. He was 19 years old. It was his first show. All he wanted to do was be um, on Broadway to, to work to become Michael Bennett. Yeah. Well, he was Michael Bennett. What he wanted to become was Jerome Robbins. Mm, nicely put. Well, it was true. Okay. He yeah. said so. <laughs> <laughs> Fine, yes, yes. Yeah, Mike was a marvelous, marvelous man. And I had great fun being with him and listening to him and his choreographic work, and I gave him ideas that some, uh, used, some of them he used. Cool. But the point was that at that point, the gentleman of the syndicate, decided that we were trying to cheat them, or we had tried to cheat them. We had lied to them. That was okay. even worse. And so I was told by somebody that there was a contract out on Dory, Michael, uh, Paul, and me. And? 
moment you have that, it changes the way you go home. Yeah. It changes the way you live your life altogether. And I was fearful. Fearful because I had three kids that I was a single parent for. Hmm. And um, I, I wanted to protect them by all means. Four weeks later, that was a long time to believe it, to know you were under a contract that somebody was looking for you. Four weeks later, approximately, I was told the contract had been called off because they had learned that they were mistaken. <laughs> Man. Oh, I've had things like I have a knife at my throat in Philadelphia, some guy, but that was an ordinary... Uh, that was a mugging, basically. Uh, ordinary mugging, yeah. Nice, nice. I've yeah. had... Uh, I was on a... <laughs> I was in... Um, Barcelona, one of those beautiful cities and most favorite of my life cities. Mm -hmm. And by making a wrong turn, I found myself on the dumps, the garbage pits of Barcelona. That, that's kind of a becoming a theme in your life, isn't it? The garbage dumps. Oh, yeah, but this was different. Uh, they yeah, they were course. garbage dumps, which were great holes in the ground. Square. It looked like a waffle, tremendous waffle. Mm. And as I was trying to find my way out... I, I saw there was a little house, a little house right there. So I came near it, and then a, a number of people came out, and they were members of the Romanies. They were living on the in the garbage dumps, because that's where they found that They built a little place, and I imagine nobody wanted to bother them. Right. But, well, they came out with machetes. Oh. Okay. And I pressed on the motor of my little du chevaux, and I got out of there by going in exactly the opposite direction <laughs> on, and ended up in the streets of Barcelona. But they were after, they were running after me and shouting, Hola, hola! Hola, yeah. I, I think they were saying something else, probably than hola. I don't know. They were just trying to convince me that they were being very nice. And if they dropped the machetes, I would have believed them. Sure, yeah. Drop I've them. had stuff like that all the time. It's part of my life, and I enjoy it. I enjoy it when I get out of it. <laughs> yeah. You are the curator of the Songwriters Hall of Fame. Yes. So, so what does that entail, and how did that? Well, start? when yeah. when when Johnny Mercer dragged me into the organization, which we were just getting together, we had no organization. He said, "I want you to help me build this up with younger people." I was younger then, and so I started working with him, building it up. When he died, Johnny, uh, uh, Sammy Khan took over work with him and at one point Sammy and Julie Stein went to see the mayor of New York one Abraham Beam oh god yeah and uh, who was a sweet little man he was he, not a great mayor but he was seemed nice yeah well the, the, some of the mayors have done much more damage than Beam mm. and um, they went to see him one day and asked if he could arrange work with them to get a place to have a museum in the city of New York. And he said, well, I'll try. But none of them have tried, really. Right. In fact, uh, Giuliani was against having a popular music situation. He was, he's a very straight-laced man who believes in straight-laced uh, entertainment. He believes in opera. That's what he loves, yeah. Opera, I guess. Good opera. Well, I happen to love opera, too. No, that's fine, too. But that wouldn't be to the uh, detriment of any of the other great music that we have produced. So, they went to the mayor's office. He told him he would do his best, and he couldn't. However, the next day, I think it was, that Sammy said, that two days later he called me. He said, Oscar, I just got an interesting thing in the mail. I said, what? He says, it's from a man named Alex Parker. Alex Parker owns number one Times Square. Number one Times Square is the building on the square, the one with the sign that goes around it. Jeez, yeah. I said, yes. He said, he'll give us an entire floor, he says, if we can set up a museum. I said, oh, yes. <laughs> he said, would you do it? I'd done a lot of it. I even done a lot of the carpentry, which I was good at, because I, I worked on my boats all the time. Mm -hmm. He said, could you do it? I said, well, where is this? He says, the eighth floor of one Times Square. After eight, seven years of running programs at the, at the uh, one Times Square, it was sold, the building was sold to two Dutchmen, two Hollanders from the Lowlands, I believe it was they. And they decided they wanted that floor. So 
so we gave up the floor, and we have not had a place since, although we've never exhibited many different areas. Meanwhile, we're still looking for a place, still trying to find it. We've had an offer, a very nice one, from five towns on Long Island. Oh, my gosh, that's where I live. Yeah, well, although well, no, you live in five towns. This is the univers- uh, college. Oh, five towns college, cool. That's on the North Shore. You're in the South. True. Well, Oscar, yeah, um, it, it. I wish you best of luck in finding or in getting that museum. I wish you, of course, best of luck on everything, and congratulations on 60 wonderful years on the radio. And I, w- I won't wish you 60 more, maybe 50 more. How's that? I'll take 20. Sounds good. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.